Hello, guys. Pat, unmute for a minute. Say hello. Thank you for the promotion, Patty. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, it does not come with a raise. I just want to make that perfectly clear. Well, <laughs> nothing is still nothing, right? <laughs> 10%, 15 sometimes. Dan, how are you? I'm well, good. How are you? Good. I haven't seen you in a little while. I know. I'm back. <laughs> how is Nugget? She's good. Crazy as ever. I see that one of the things we've been complaining about has been changed in this last Zoom upgrade is that uh, the, host, the host and the co-host can now raise our hands, which is kind of nice. Nara's always had a problem because she couldn't raise her hand. She had to go. So that is one nice thing. I don't know how many of you have read through the agenda, but there's not going to be a lot tonight. There are no committees met last month, so we have very, very little on the agenda. Um, the one thing that I did want to bring up, Patty, is that on the special meeting, they have me as absent, and I was here, but they said that I voted yes. Okay, then when we get to that, we definitely will need to, um, we'll, we'll ask if there are any changes before we vote on it. Make sure that the, the note taker gets everything down. Great, thank you, appreciate it. Speaking of which. Did anyone say which? Hi, how are you feeling? <laughs> Hi, <laughs> you like my little job? No, I just noticed I, I had said something about note taker and then what do I see but John's name po popping up. How are you, John? Welcome. Hi, I'm, I'm hanging in there. How are you guys? Pretty good. Uh, we have just been informed that there will be some notes that have to be taken about the minutes before they're voted on. So I will okay. just figure out what, what was done wrong and let it go from there. We have eight, nine, 10, 11, two more. We start this meeting. I know it's not a very inviting meeting because there's uh, not, not that much on it. Hi, Patricia, good to see you. I was, I was just explaining that since none of the committees met last month, we had nothing to carry forward onto the board meeting. So we do have a couple of interesting speakers. We have a representative from Jimmy Gomez's office and um, our fearless leader, Raquel Beltran, will be here. And Jimmy's so really been out there in the community. He had a town hall meeting last week. It was really good. Yeah, um, he was going to be here tonight, but I don't know. There's something going on in D.C., so I don't know. Seems to be a bit of bother in DC. I don't know. I 
really thought that when I started doing Zoom meetings, people would get here early because they didn't have to commute. But sometimes it takes them longer to get to where they're supposed to go to when it's easier. That's very true. Oh dear. Sean, let's bring you in where you belong. Ah, the new mummy is here. As soon as I've got the faces, having the box up is wonderful, but I need to see the faces to know people are here. And then we'll do a roll call. Um, hi, Mindy. How's the baby? She's good. I'll send you the baby too. <laughs> I, I saw the holiday picture. She's adorable. Just adorable. All right. So we have enough people here. Ryan, are you here? I don't see your face, but. I am here, yes. You are here. Okay. Then I think it's time to take roll. Like I said, it's going to be a kind of an easy meeting. Don't expect too many of those, but we've got one tonight. So, um, Claudia, are you up to calling roll or do you want me to do it? Um, if you can do it, because I, I still don't have it. Okay, that's fine. Um, I should ask, John, are you ready? Yep, I'm ready. Um, I could also send you the agenda for minute taking, Claudia. You're not getting my emails, are you? I, this is, something is going very wrong with email. I'm not sure what it is. It's not just happening here. It's in a lot of emails. All right. Well, I will. I will start the roll call anyway. I'm here. Ryan. Here. Pat Barrett. Here. Wendell. Ian. Joan. Here. Dan Kernow. Here. Michael Delajani. Here. Nara is not here. She had a bed. Exactly. Um, Colleen? I thought I saw her name come up. No? Tony? Here. Mindy? I need to yeah, Alex is not here. I know that. Patricia. Here. Marcus. Hmm. I just talked to him a little while ago and he was coming. Mac is not here. He is out sick. Tyler. Claudia. Here. Rick. Here. Robert is not here. John Swartz, I think okay. he's going blonde. <laughs> <laughs> okay, alternate. Uh, Michael Burbank. And Sean. Hi, Sean. Like the color behind you today. It's a nice, I don't know, fun color. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. We have just 13 by my count. Do you agree with that, John? Yep, 13. All right, well then we shall continue onward. Uh, first of all, do we have, this is kind of crazy since we have absolutely nothing of this type of nature on the agenda, but I will ask anyway. How, are there any declarations of ex parte communication? Okay. Then we're going to get right on to the speakers. We're going to start with city, state, elected officials, except for the two that are privately listed, which would be Congressman Gomez's office and Raquel Betran from Dunn. 
Uh, Mario, I see that you're here. Would you like to raise your hand? <clears throat> raise your hand? Okay, very good. There you are. Speak to us. I'm speaking. So first of all, Happy New Year, uh, board members. Hope you all had a safe, uh, happy, a safe and wonderful uh, Happy New Year and holiday season. Uh, just one announcement related to the neighborhood council. Uh, yeah, neighborhood council elections. As you know, uh, the candidate filing period closed on January 5th. Um, next, we have the vote by mail application period. Um, it begins on January 22nd. This year's uh, elections, it's all gonna be vote by mail and you do have to request a, uh, a, a ballot. And you can do that at clerk.lacity.org forward slash elections and just follow the prompt to your neighborhood councils. It is a postage paid uh, envelope, so you don't have to worry about putting a stamp on there. Um, candidate photos and statements uh, are due on April 6th and election day is April 13th. So uh, good luck. Well, well, well I thought well, it was March 23rd. What's that? The election day. No. We Let me were confirm. Given on the 23rd originally. Hold on. Um, Hi, everybody. <clears throat> election day is April 13th. April 13th. Okay. Let me, let me just confirm that. But, uh, Please do because I do have paperwork that says the 23rd on it. Okay, let's see. Penny, I'm here, by the way. Thank you, Marcus. Uh huh. Thank you. Oh, you know, you may be right. I'm sorry. Yeah, March 23rd. I apologize. Okay. Got to keep so you on. So then, yeah, you do. So then that means that the uh, vote by mail application period begins on January 22nd. Um, so you, that, that's when you can start requesting your, your, uh, your ballot. And the candidate uh, photo and Statement deadline is March 16th. So if you plan to submit a photo and uh, statement, do so by the 16th. And that's currently what I have right now. And uh, again, look forward to 2021. Mario, you said clerk.lacity.org slash election? Correct. It's election up plural. Can you repeat that? Election plural? Oh, now I see it. Thank you. I'd also okay. like to remind people that we have a page on our website that has all these links. When you go to the front page, if you look at the menu at the top, there will be an item that says election, and it takes you right to this page where we have all of the links that have been set up. So that, that is available to you all. So anything else, Mario? Uh, that's all I have for now. All right. Well, as usual, we thank you for joining us. Mario, I'm My so pleasure. sorry. One more thing. I've actually gone yes. to this page before, uh, and maybe it's just because the, it's too early, but when you go to register to vote, it sends you to the Secretary of State, which basically has you do it through like the federal voting system. And obviously, um, not everybody is a citizen who's voting and a lot of other that, issues. You're, you're going through the wrong links. Let's, let's take a look at that off. We've got somebody who's handling that stuff for us, Robertino. Let's go through with him. let's go through it with him and make sure that everything is right. Yeah, you should. You, because you Mario should be, is with Dunn, and Dunn is not handling that. The city clerk's office is. We should correct. be talking. To our crap. Yeah, you you should all just be going through the. Uh, make sure you go under the neighborhood council uh, elections. There's there's going to be a big difference there. And from now on, please. Board members, if you will raise your hand when you wish to speak or ask a question, because you know we're going to get into trouble otherwise. Thank you. Eddie, just quickly, I have Tyler, and he's inside of the attendees because he had the wrong link. Um, I don't know if you can promote him from over there. So, Doing it as we speak. Thank you. Got him. Did you promote him over? Yep. Okay. And uh, John Parton. If you can make a note that uh, Tyler Murphy is here. Yep, I just did. Thank you, I appreciate it. Where'd Tyler end up? He left. Hmm. 
I moved him and he left the other place, but he hasn't gotten here yet. Well, we'll just watch for him come back. Not not a perfect system, but this Zoom stuff is getting us through, so we will be nice to it. I, um, I still see him on attendee and he has his hand up. Okay, we'll do it one more time. Promote to panelist. Oh, yep, he's here now. Okay, great. Very good. Uh, then we do have, uh, we have uh, Joan Lee here representing Jimmy Gomez's office. I'm promoting you to panelist right now, Joan. And I, I know that uh, your boss was unable to attend because there's something going on in DC or something like that. <laughs> We're pleased to have you here. Hi everyone! Thank you so much, Patty, and the board member for board members for having me. Um, the congressman sends his regrets. As Patty mentioned, he was supposed to be here tonight, but he's actually in DC right now and voting. So he and other members of Congress are currently doing votes right now. So he sends his regrets, um, but he hopes to join one of the neighborhood council meetings um, in the future. Um, I just want to introduce myself. Um, I am Joan Lee. Uh, I I'm a field representative for Congressman Gomez, and I just started covering downtown. So um, I'll be dropping by um, from time to time. And if again, if you need any help or assistance or have any questions, you can always contact me. My email is joan.lee at mail.house.gov. And that's Joan, J-O-A-N, last name is L-E-E. -E. Um, but I just wanted to provide a couple of updates um, just with what's going on with the Congressman. Um, you know, he, right now, what happened last week at the Capitol has been sort of uh, on the forefront of um, most members of Congress and what they're doing right now. And they were actually voting um, on a resolution calling on Vice President Pence to invoke the 25th Amendment. Um, that passed, but a Vice President Pence just wrote a letter to Speaker Pelosi saying that he will not be doing that. So it seems like tomorrow morning, um, the members of the House will be voting on impeachment. Um, so that's a major kind of update for you all. And the Congressman obviously supports impeachment considering all the events that transpired this past week and for the past couple of years. Um, so that's sort of the biggest thing that he's been working on um, in this new Congress. Um, but as you may be aware, aware uh, Congress passed a COVID relief package last year in December, and you know there's a lot of great benefits that came with that. But obviously, um, more that needs to be done. So, with um, hopefully with the Democrats taking over the Senate and with President-elect Biden taking office, House Democrats are hoping to pass another relief package that would include more direct rent and mortgage relief, um, extend the federal eviction moratorium, provide student loan loan debt forgiveness and also provide monthly $2,000 checks to Americans making less than $100,000 per year. Um, so those are just some of the things that are coming up down the pike. Um, and our office continues to provide services for um, the constituents in the Congressman's district. So we have had people who haven't received their $600 stimulus payments or still haven't received their $1,200 from the previous round. So our office can definitely help with that. Um, our office has been helping with um, businesses with their SBA loans. We help with IRS, USCIS, um, a whole range of services. So if there's anything that you may need assistance with, um, our office is available. And lastly, the Congressman loves to be in the district, but unfortunately with COVID, everything has been kind of virtual. Um, and so he's been hosting telephone town halls and is trying to host them monthly. Um, he just had one last week and he hopes to continue to have them in the future. Uh, if you want to know more about them, you can always sign up uh, for our, his email alerts. And we do send out calls pr prior to the telephone town hall letting people know that he's having them. But um, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you again. Any questions from our board? I will let you raise your hands. We're also going to give the attendees a chance to ask a question if they so choose. So let's, uh, is there anyone who would like to ask a question of Ms. Lee? No, then- I have my hand up, Patty. There we go, there is one person. All right, 
Kevin, I am going to allow you to talk. Thank you. Um, uh, my name is Kevin. I live downtown. Um, I wanted to know if the congressman supports, uh, now that we have a new administration, uh, vocally and forcefully backing uh, rent and mortgage cancellation uh, so that we don't have a massive wave of evictions at the uh, end of this pandemic or even sooner. Um, it's like canceling rent and mortgages is really the only way to go. And I wanted to know where the congressman stands on that. Thanks. Um, thank you, Kevin, for that question. Um, the congressman, that's a very interesting question. We've been getting a lot of, um, that's been getting a lot of traction and the congressman definitely um, understands why rent cancellation and mortgage cancellation is important. Um, currently he supports um, providing more rent relief um, and, and supporting the renters through that. Um, but I can definitely take that down as a comment for, for, for you, for the congressman. I know this is a huge issue um, with a major housing crisis um, and major homelessness crisis. And with all that's happening, there's soon to be a major eviction crisis as well. So um, I thank you for asking that question and I will definitely pass your comment to a congressman. All right, I don't see any other hands up with the attendees, so I'll close public comment. I see one panelist hand up, and that is Claudia. Claudia, please ask your question. And the mute first, honey. There you go. Hi, uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, my question is if there's anything in sight for a public-private partnership with uh, um, someone like Trilla for the undocumented immigrants because um, we don't qualify for anything. No 1200, no unemployment, nothing. So um, as one in every four Californians are immigrants or related to an immigrant, um, I was hoping that those things were being taken into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. That's a really great question. And um, actually, this this round of stimulus payments, the six hundred dollars, it includes um, mixed status families are are included, and they previously weren't included for the twelve hundred dollars. The congressman has been fighting so that um, everyone can get the stimulus payment regardless of their status. But obviously, there's been some pushback with that from you know Republicans and other members of Congress. Um, but he he we do do a lot of things with Churla, so that's a great question. Um, that's a great idea as well. Um, we can try to see how we can collaborate with Trilla in the future, but the Congressman has been a very big advocate for ensuring that there's more um, benefits and funds available for those who are undocumented. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't have any more hands up. I know that uh, we're, we're really looking forward to when the, when uh, Mr. Gomez can be here on his, you know, be here to be with us. We appreciate what he's doing right now. Uh, since we have no other questions for you, I'm just going to thank you for joining us. I know it's not easy to just come in like this when, when the speakers, uh, the speaker, the, the presumed speaker can't make it. But we really appreciate you being here, and uh, let's keep in touch. And if there's anything you feel you need us to know, please uh, keep in touch with us. And Thank, uh, thank the uh, for all the work. We really appreciate it. Anyway, I'm not sure where I am with that speech, but thank you very much, Joan. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking at the list. I don't see that. Uh, wait, let me check it now. I, I don't see Raquel Beltran yet. Uh, so we'll go on to some other things and wait for her to get here. Uh, right now, we will move forward to general public comment. If there is anyone who would like to make a public comment on something that is not on the agenda, now would be the time to do it. If you're on a phone, uh, actually no one is on a phone, so I'll skip that. Uh, anyone who is interested, please raise your hand. 
Peter? Yeah, hi. So my name is Peter Kloon. I'm a downtown resident. Um, I actually emailed many of you about this already, but just want to bring to your attention um, a recent development in the Jose Huizar corruption case. Um, so last Thursday, uh, the federal government signed a non-prosecution agreement with Carmel Partners, um, and I encourage you all to go and read it. Uh, the cliff notes are Carmel Partners was responsible for $75,000 in bribes to Jose Huizar. In return, Huizar gutted the affordable housing requirements in their 520 Mateo project in the Arts District taking it from 52 very low income units to 28 moderate income units. In the indictment, it saved Carmel Partners $14 million. Right? The indictment also tells how an executive at Carmel bragged about this over email. So in this non-prosecution agreement, Carmel has admitted to these things, right? And agreed to pay a $1.2 million fine. So if you add that up, that's 75,000 for bribes, 1.2 million in a fine, but a gain of $14 million, right? So they are literally profiting almost $13 million from their bribery. And I just think that's completely unacceptable. So I wanted to use this public comment to formally make a stakeholder proposal for action, calling on this neighborhood council to tell our city leaders that we demand two things. One, that the full $14 million be paid back to the downtown community. And two, that 52 new units of very low income, permanently affordable housing be created either at the 520 Mateo development or at the Atelier and 8th and Grand developments that Carmel Partners also owns in downtown LA. So Carmel owns 1,498 apartments in downtown. 52 units is 3.4% of that. I think that's very doable. Um, I also ask that if Carmel doesn't agree to discuss these terms, that this neighborhood council withdraw and withhold any and all requested letters of support, oppose any permit requests for Carmel, any of their partners, affiliates, or tenants. Carmel partners should not be allowed to profit from bribery and should not be welcome to do any business in downtown until they've started to make our community whole for what they stole from us. So I wholeheartedly encourage you all to take action. Um, and thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. I do not see any other hands up for public comment. So I'm going to close public comment and we'll go to some of the fun stuff now. Uh, has everyone read the two sets of minutes? We had a regular meeting and we had our special meeting on the 8th of December. I'm going to start with the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting. Are there any changes or modifications or is there anything wrong with them? Uh, if there are, please raise your hand and we'll make sure that our note taker gives us that, takes down that information. All right, seeing none, then may I have a motion to approve the minutes? I, Pat Barrett makes a motion to approve the minutes. Thank you, Pat. May I have a second, please? Second. Where did that come from? I'm sorry. Marcus. Marcus, Marcus. very good, thank you. <clears throat> um, all right, then we're going to do this the easy way. If anyone is voting no, please raise your hand. Anyone abstaining, please raise your hand. Dan Kernow and Audrey, uh, Audrey, you're for John Swartz. So those two will show as, okay, you've got it already, John, never mind. Very good, thank you. All right, now we'll take a look at the minutes from the special meeting. I believe that someone did say that they had some changes that needed to be made to that one. Pat, would you please tell us what needs to be changed? Yes, um, you have me there as not, not here, but you have me voting as yes. So I need to be changed from absent to present for the special meeting. Is the vote correct? Pardon me? Is the vote correct on the, the minutes? The vote is correct because I did vote yes. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. And uh, John, if you'll make sure Claudia gets that note, we'll, we'll change the minutes before we put them back. With that change, may I have a motion to approve the minutes? Pat Barrett will make a motion to approve the minutes. Thank you, Pat. My, uh, may I get a second, please? Second. Thank you. That was uh, Michael Delajani's alternate, by the way, John, if you didn't catch that. All right, same thing as before. Would anyone who's voting no, please raise their hand. Okay, anyone abstaining, please raise your hand.
the same two again. And I believe for the same reason, because they weren't here, which is a very good reason. Okay, thank you. That's taken care of. Uh, my report, election information. I believe that uh, Marcus, I'm sorry, that uh, Mario covered everything I was gonna say about that. Let's take a look at the dates, make sure those who are running, please make sure that you know all of the dates and that you've got all the information you need to continue going forward. And let's be really careful about calling this registering to vote. If you say you need to register to vote because I'm running for the neighborhood council, people are gonna tell you they're already registered to vote. This is not the same thing and we've got to be very careful that people understand that being registered to vote does not mean that you can vote in the neighborhood council election. You need to enroll for a neighborhood council ballot. So let's please be very careful about that. Um, okay, actually, we had a really lightweight month of December. Everyone took the holidays off. None of the committees met, which is why we have such a short uh, agenda for today. So uh, that is all I have to say to you right now. Aren't you guys lucky? I don't have anything else. Do I have any liaison reports today? Would you please raise your hand? Okay. Uh, the budget representative is not here today. She had a bit of an accident and is having a, a couple of problems, so she's not available. Um, so let's let's go to new business and we will go to financial. Uh, before I go there, Peter Clune, your hand is still up. Is that still from the last time? Thank you. Just so there's no confusion. Uh, so, uh, Tony, you're on. Yes, um, I'd like to um, I'd like to make a motion to uh, approve the December 2020 monthly expenditure report. Which is in the packet, by the way, folks. May I have a second to that, please? Guys, I need a second. Okay. Claudia. Thank you, Claudia. All right. Um, Then let's, let's, so you're gonna have to call roll on this one, Tony, you're on. Okay, uh, Ryan Afari? Yes. Pat Barrett? Yes. Uh, Wendell is not on, is he? No. Um, Joan? 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 Yes. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yes. Ed, Michael Delajani. Yes, Michael Delajani's alternate. Uh, uh, yes. Tony, your volume just went down like halfway. I don't know if you moved your mic or. Might have something to do with the connection. Okay. Nara? Nara is not here tonight. Oh, she's not. Uh, Colleen's not here either, is she? No. Uh, Wendy? Yep. Yes. Uh, Rick? Yes. Alex is not here, right? No, he is not. Uh, not Lewis. It's Lewis. Did he say Patricia Lewis? Yes. Yeah, yeah. you're really hard to hear, Tony. Sorry. Oh, it's, it's, it's up all the way, so I don't know what's going on. Uh, Marcus? Yes. Uh, is Mac here? Yes. Yes, he I arrived late. Did you hear me? Yep. Uh, Claudia? Yes. Tyler is Tyler? also here. Tyler? Yes. Uh, John Schwartz, ultimate? Yes. 
John Smith? Yes. And do we have Michael Burbank's alternate? No. Michael Burbank's alternate, no? No. Okay. Uh, I have 15 yeses, is that correct? How many do we have here? Yep, that's what I have. Okay. Passes. Um, next motion, um, the D-Line board shall approve an amount not to exceed $100 for business cards, vendors, city of LA, monies to come from the outreach budget. I have a second. Besides, this is really simple. We second. Here, using business cards. We have only one set of business cards that's been requested. We need $100 to be approved for the budget. Can I get a second? Second, Claudia. I'll give you a third. <laughs> Can I ask my question? Yes, of course. Just really quickly, are, why are we getting business cards right before the election? Shouldn't we wait till we see who's elected? I can't hear you, Ryan. Please speak. I up. said, I said, shouldn't we wait till we see who's elected before we get new business cards? No, because we had an order for for one set of business cards that is being fulfilled right now, and we need to have it. Uh, we need to pay for it. They won't let it go that long. Okay. Believe me, when we get a new board and everybody wants business cards, a hundred dollars is going to seem like nothing. It's a, it's a big, it's a big expense. All right, go Everyone ahead, Tom. Call. Ryan? Ryan, can you hear me? I can, yes. Can you hear it? Yes. Joan? Joan, can you hear us? Joan? Okay, yes, I can hear you. Dan? Yes. Michael Delajani's alternate? Yes. Uh, Mindy? Yes. Rick? Yes. Patricia Lewis? Yes. Yes, Marcus? did you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Marcus? Yes. Mac? Yes. Claudia? Yes. Tyler Murphy? Yes. Uh, John Schwartz alternate? Yes. John Smith? Yes. And I get 15 with that one as well. Good passes. Okay, thank you. And I see that uh, Raquel Betran has joined us. So what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to promote you to panelist. And please introduce yourself to the board. I'm sure they're happy to find you. Good evening, everybody. How are you? Thank you. Are you ready for me to go forward? Absolutely. Okay. All, All right. right. I'm, I'm Zoom bomb bouncing um, this evening. Um, I've been uh, from the Valley to South LA, and now I'm back downtown. How about that? That's what we do. <laughs> Welcome. It is amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Happy 2021, even though 2021 landed with Godzilla feet, <laughs> no matter where we are, it's been Godzilla feet landed hard. Uh, I do want to say Happy New Year. I'm happy to see all of you. And, uh, and I want to start by thanking you for the work that you do for the Neighborhood Council. And I'm glad to be here. Um, this was one of the neighborhood councils that I think got canceled uh, as part of the listening tour last year. And um, I was down to, I think, maybe 10 neighborhood councils in the month of March. 
um, that I needed to visit. At that time, I was visiting on average six neighborhood councils a week driving around. Um, and uh, in order to make my goal of hitting all neighborhood councils in my first six months of service. So, um, so we kind of got, got interrupted by a little thing called the pandemic. So I certainly have seen many of you. I haven't been absent from, absent from neighborhood councils. Uh, have met with you quite a few times, several of you as individuals in different ways since uh, the pandemic started uh, and hit us so hard in March and April. So, um, but I, I really wanted to be able to circle back and meet with you as a board and make sure that I revisited the commitment I made to meet with you as part of the listening tour. So I, I wanna thank you for allowing me to join you um, this evening. Um, there are some, um, maybe I wanna just list for you the things that I'd like to talk about and make sure Madam Chairman that it's okay for me to cover these these topics in case there's something else that you, you or your board would like me to address. But um, I do wanna talk about where we are with our, with our budget, city budget process is underway. I'd like to talk with you all about um, the, uh, the election strategy and the plans that we have uh, and where we are with the election process. Um, and then I'd like to talk with you about um, some reorganization that's taking place in the department, why that reorganization is taking place. And then the last thing I'd like to just touch base with you around on is the, um, uh, what, what we see happening from a process perspective. Um, and some considerations we're giving related to what happens after the pandemic? What happens when there's no stay at home executive orders? And what, what, what will we be doing here in our neighborhood council system as it relates to virtual meetings, things of that nature? And Actually, those, that sounds like a great agenda. Okay, Please great. do what you would okay, like. Good. So I'm gonna plow through and um, so I'm trying to cover a lot of territory. So if I start going too fast and you want to in, inject, uh, 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 intercept me and ask me to respond to a question, please feel free to do so. So it, um, it, it works better for us if you speak and then we ask for questions. After. Okay, great, no problem. All right, good. So in terms of um, where the department is and the reorganization is tied to kind of some of the budget considerations. See, I started with the department in September of last year. So now it's a year and um, three months. And I've had a grand time and have appreciated every single one of you and the work that you do and, uh, and the feedback and the communication that, that we've had, certainly during my service. Um, I'm pretty visible in the neighborhood council system. I'm all over the city. It's been a lot easier since there have been virtual meetings and I've, I've taken advantage of that. But I was teasing the field uh, staff today, uh, this week, and, and they were realizing that I'm out in the field more than they are, sometimes collectively at times. So, so I hear from a lot of neighborhood councils in different parts of the city, and I take everything everybody says under, under advisement and what we do. Since I have been with the department in my first two months here, I had to cut by about a quarter of a million dollars immediately within the first two months while we prepared our proposed budget for this fiscal year. Um, all in all, since uh, since December of last year, we've cut about maybe half a million dollars total in the in the department's budget. Um, we were looking to increase the department's budget in this fiscal year in order to mainly because we were requesting funds in order to be able to administer an election outreach strategy that got cut as soon as the pandemic hit. All bets were off. Everybody was starting from scratch, and the pandemic took priority. So when we moved into this fiscal year, um, we ended up with you know with a, with a smaller a num smaller staff. I had 35 staff people when I came to the department. We're now down to about 28, I think it is, mainly because we had vacancies that we weren't allowed to fill. Like all city departments, so nobody picked on us. We just you know we had to be troopers like everybody else. But we had lost almost three or four NEAs between January, December and January. So those positions were frozen. We weren't able to fill those positions um, like all other vacancies. Uh, this month we lost Betty Wong Oyama. She, her last day with the department is Friday. She spent 20 years working in the department. She's retiring. She opted for the uh, early incentive program. So we celebrated her her work today in the department. So that's gonna short us down to probably, I think it's either 11 or 12 neighborhood empowerment advocates to service the entire neighborhood council system. 
Um, so we've been doing some reorganization related to that. On average, neighborhood councils are gonna be serving about eight neighborhood councils on top of their other responsibilities. So for example, Lorenzo on top of servicing his neighborhood councils, he's responsible for our grievance procedure and our grievance process in the department. I'm gonna to speak to that in a minute. So uh, with Betty leaving, we have a reorganization going on. So there's, you know, we, we do this triaging process. We have a, a way of measuring the intensity of all the neighborhood councils. Some require more attention than others um, for different reasons and um, try to make NEA assignments based on uh, intensity ratings. Also, we take a look at how many meetings they have per week, that they don't have meetings that are overlapping on the same night. All of that has to get kind of figured out when we think about uh, NEA and NC assignments. The virtual meeting process has allowed us to switch neighborhood council NEAs across the city. So they, so we don't have people just dedicated to the Valley, just dedicated to South LA. The, because of the budget cuts, actually it's worked in our favor to have virtual meetings because we can actually shift folks around much more easily because they don't have to drive um, to these destinations. And so that has been, that has been a plus. But what we did do in this period of time it relates to one of our four objectives in the department that we've been able to sustain even through all these budget cuts. And that is to, to, to streamline the way in which we do work. Um, I committed to neighborhood councils that we would be reviewing the job descriptions of all of the neighborhood powerment advocates, updating it, making it relevant, circulating it to them, getting their feedback. And we now have an updated rule, roles and responsibilities of neighborhood councils in order to ensure uniformity across the board by NEAs and the way in which they provide direct neighborhood council support to neighborhood councils. Um, the other goal that we have that we've been able to com stay committed to is our goal to improve our relationship with neighborhood councils. I get a lot of uh, lots of comments from neighborhood council about the work of the NEAs. We are committed to improving our relationship with neighborhood councils. And sometimes we had neighborhood councils with whom we didn't have a good relationship and other times we had a pretty good relationship and other times it's just kind of in between. We're committed to improving our relationship with neighborhood councils, improving and streamlining and our efficiencies was a big was important for us to be able to build a more trustful relationship with neighborhood councils uh, and we're continuing to work work on some of those areas what we're doing with the grievance procedures implementing procedures writing them up it's a huge project it'll take me about another four months to finish all of that but we're well under under on our way to to making that happen we're updating our website and as part of our website, we slowed down on it in order to be able to get input from neighborhood councils of what you wanted on our website. We were actually on schedule to get it up and running in December and I slowed it down and decided that thanks to Hack for LA, they were able to bring on a consultant called Super by Design. Some of you participated in those, uh, in those workshops, giving us feedback about the website. We slowed it down, we've embraced that. We now have some, some direct feedback from all of you. Just yesterday, I met with the consultant that's doing the website. We reviewed what neighborhood councils provided to us. We're looking at the budget to see how many of those pages we can actually update and implement in this phase. We're not gonna get money to update the website again for a couple of years. The city's, the city's in bad shape wow. and not getting no money. So I have to make it work this time and I'll do my best to try to, to do all the things that you asked us to do based, based on your feedback. Um, but on that, we hope to have policies and procedures, implementing procedures on the website so that you can go take a look at it and, and have a good sense of how some of these things are supposed to work so that they're visible and transparent to you and accessible at all times. The other aspect of our goals was improving the way that city departments interface with neighborhood councils. We've done a lot of work just in my short period of time in this area. We just hosted in December uh, we wrote and, and, and implemented a public engagement. Um, we wrote a handbook and hosted a training for city employees. 300 city employees participated in those trainings in December. And what we covered for them were best practices on how to engage properly with, communi with communities, how to message, what technology to use in order to have the broadest reach, particularly given the digital divide. We did a survey of, of city departments at first and then decide and then hired a consultant. They helped us work with this handbook and did the training. 
very, very, very successful. We are working with city departments uh, to improve the way in which they interface with these. So as one example is the cannabis department based on ordinance changes by the city council has some obligations as it relates to communication and, and notifications of neighborhood councils about licensees that are coming into their neighborhood council area. They consulted with us. We gave them advice on how to advise their potential licensees on how they should communicate with neighborhood councils. And in short, amongst other details, we said, give yourselves, tell your licensees to take uh, at least 90 days. Give neighborhood councils one month to hear what the issue is, the second month to have a conversation about, about any questions that they have, and then give them the third month to make a decision. Don't try to cram all that into one meeting. It's not fair to the NCs. They deserve an opportunity to be able to hear from stakeholders, to discuss these issues, to ask you questions. Have you come back with answers to the questions as part of their deliberations? That's the kind of work that we do with city departments and, uh, and it's, it's working quite well. Another, another goal was for us to be able to um, be strategic partners with you. That has been pretty successful in many, many areas, but I wanna do better around those issues. I, get, I have meetings with NC leaders that have an idea of what they wanna do, wanna proceed with the project, ask us, ask us for guidance. We wanna see more of that and be available to you more frequently around, around only as you need it. You might not need us to do that, but we wanna know that we're available for you to consult with us around some of these things and so that we can be strategic partners for you as you think about, about the work that you do. In our proposed budget for 21-22, we've submitted our second revision to the, to the, uh, to the CAO we sent you, we've sent you both versions of it. So we've also sent you the more recent version. The last one was in your monthly profiles in the month of June, January. Uh, our, our proposed budget is uh, uh, now in the hands of the CAO's office. We're scheduled to meet with the mayor's uh, budget team in February. It's, it's part of the regular process. At that point, we'll know, um, if not a little bit sooner, what other additional changes to the budget they'll be requesting of us, you know, moving in the direction of we, we're expecting to have a request for cuts um, because of the city's financial crisis. What that, what that looks like, I don't know. I will share that. Let me just back up and share and explain a little more about the city's budget process. Our base budget is given to us by the CAO. So it's not so, and when they, the reason why all city departments, general managers are given their budget, base budget, it's not what you just had last year rolling over. They issue you your base budget every year. The base budget that's issued to us takes into consideration citywide obligations. I'm sure you've been reading a lot about salary increases for city employees that were negotiated last year as part of labor collective bargaining negotiations. Um, lots of discussion about that. Um, currently there's discussions with the labor groups about, um, about postponing those agreed upon salary increases. That is one reason why our budget for this fiscal year, the proposed budget is 7% higher than it was in last, last year. The second thing that causes, causes us to have a 7% increase from our base budget from last year is we've absorbed the cost of the innovation and office of community engagement. There are two staff positions in the OCE, Julian's position and Grace Kim's position. Those positions are not in the base budget, what are called regular positions. There are two types of positions in the city, regular positions and resolution positions. When I came to the department, that innovation division was just getting created. I had to absorb the cost of that. That was about $170,000 in my existing budget. That then cost in this particular year becomes a, an increase above and beyond the base budget. So those two factors, cause our budget to have to reflect a 7% increase, maybe 7.5% increase in the proposed budget. So I'm just sharing with you what that is, how it devolved, what it constitutes. And that's a 7% increase in our budget after a hundred thousand dollar cut. So it's, wow. a, it's a net, it's a net difference. So, so we cut, we cut, and that's, that's what our budget is, is reflected. There are about three neighborhood councils, mainly in the San Pedro area, who have taken action uh, and are uh, to ask the mayor to cut our budget by 20%. If that happens, that's eight positions in our department. So I'm taking time to 
share with you the budget process, how it works. You have to decide for yourselves whether you want to weigh in on the budget process, but I thought while I was here that I would explain what the budget process is, how it works, and allow you to ask me questions. The next thing I, so the reorganization really ties into all of these budget cuts, all of these changes, Betty leaving, needing to reassign NEAs. We will communicate with you what those changes are this month. We expect for them to go into effect in February. And then we'll see more changes in April because hopefully uh, one of our staff members that's been on full-time disaster service assignment working on Project Room Key should be returned to us in April. So when that happens, we'll have some more reorganization um, and, uh, and reassigning and NCs and NEAs related to that. We got one back in December. Um, he's picking up some of uh, Lorenzo's work. Mario's doing those assignments because we have Mario dedicated 75% of his time in the month of January just to writing and implementing all the procedures associated with the grievance process and the grievance procedures. We have several um, regional panels that have to be created. The department did not have those procedures written out and clearly articulated. We need Lorenzo to buckle down and to spend his some time working on that so that we can kind of smooth line that process. So Mario is taking all of Lorenzo's NCs for this month Hopefully my, uh, Lorenzo will be back on the block in, in February. So, so those transitions are taking place. Lots of policies and NCs always want to be sure that the department takes their into consideration for policies that are considered. We are doing that. The first one is the digital media policy that has, uh, has um, gained um, a lot of interest. What I will share, and so we're, we're, we're I, if you were to ask me what aspects of the digital media policy I feel strongly about, I would tell you that I don't know. We're getting input from neighborhood councils. We're having two info sessions. We've had one, we have another one to walk through the digital media policy. Um, neighborhood councils are weighing in, taking action on the policy. Most of the elements in that policy come from city policy. So we anchored on what the city's policy is. Neighborhood councils are, are obligated to follow city policy. That was our starting point. We're circulating it out for feedback. We'll be submitting a revision to, um, in February, we'll be presenting an item to Bonk that summarizes the feedback, all the community impact statements that have been submitted to date. The commission will decide what guidance and instruction wants to give the department in terms of amendments to the policy. And um, assuming they move forward, they could decide they don't want to have a policy on all of this. But assuming that we move forward based on their guidance, we'll rewrite it. And uh, I don't know what they're going to decide in terms of recirculating the policy. I'm going to be asking, and I, and I think they will, recirculate it in amendment form to continue to get feedback. We're not rushing into it. But everything that's in that policy basically responds to things that and problem tries to solve problems that we've had in the neighborhood council system. Most important, we want to let you know that there are liability issues that neighborhood councils must be aware of. We're taking time to make them aware you aware of it as it relates to your use in, in digital, digital media. Um, it's been suggested that um, what we could have done is just have a kind of one pager. And, and in hindsight, that probably could have happened, but I'll tell you that what it would have looked like is a one pager with a link that points to the city's policy that then kind of mushrooms out. We kind of embedded that language in this to let you digest it and give us feedback on it. So, so we'll see where we land on that, but we are getting your input on all of it. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of problems that we had that, that, that necessitated the need for, for, a for a policy. I'll give you two examples. We had a situation where some neighborhood council board members were not happy with a vote that somebody took on an issue. They launched a campaign on social media against that individual, attacked them on social media, tagged her employer and asked her employer through social media to fire her for the way she voted on her neighborhood council board. That person resigned from her board. There's another situation of a, of a neighborhood council that had an education committee chair that began to organize a candidate form for LAUSD candidate seeking office to the board. That neighborhood council committee chair, education committee chair was already supporting privately one of those two candidates. As a result, the second candidate chose not to show up for the forum. That forum was never approved by the board. 
All of this was happening using social media and digital media, including a private newsletter that that committee chair was a host for that was closed and not open to the public. So he ended up continuing to have the candidate forum with the one candidate on this closed medium that only he had access to. The board never stopped it. The board never took action. The board never reprimanded that committee chair for moving forward in the name of the neighborhood council to hold a candidate forum for one candidate. So I just wanna to offer to you that there was, a, there was a reason for it. So, you know, it isn't that I didn't have anything else to do and decided, why don't we just do this digital media policy and cause total disruption in the neighborhood council system. So we hope that you'll be partners with us to think through what a policy should look like in order for it not to be disruptive for you, but also to be able to address some of these things so that, so that when that stuff happens, it affects the reputation of all neighborhood councils, not just one. And we hear that all the time. So hopefully you'll be able to lend your voice in a way that helps us think through what, what might be good around these issues. The code of conduct is the next big policy that's going to be revised. We have a work group that's already working on it that includes the Civil and Human Rights Commission staff, Labor Relations Division staff, our leadership team, our directors, uh, people in the personnel department that are working on implementing a workplace equity policy at the mayor's instruction for city employees and the Neighborhood Council Advice Division. The last time the Code of Conduct was updated was in 2016. Um, and what we're finding is that, um, that, that you know, there, there is a need to update the Code of Conduct. Uh, there have been requests from neighborhood councils who have been trying to, you know, to manage their, their application of the code of conduct, feeling that it doesn't have enough teeth, enough clarity. We're working on all of that. Again, it'll be circulated. We'll submit a draft to the commission. Uh, neighborhood councils will have an opportunity to weigh in. Please pay attention to it. Please, please stay with us on, all, on that process. If, if the commission uses a similar process for getting input that was used for the sensor removal policy, it'll probably get floated for about six months. We're not rushing into it, but I just want you to be aware that those are two, that's another policy that's coming down the line that we'll be working on that we hope that you'll stay tuned to and, and, and tell us, you know, give us your voice on that um, and stay with it, you know, kind of toward the end because it'll, it'll have lots of revisions. Um, I, I now want to just kind of move into talking about um, the virtual governance environment that we're working in. And a couple things to think about. One is um, we were really challenged in April, as were you, when the pandemic hit, stay at home executive orders came out, um, two modifications to the Brown Act related to the ability for the public to participate with their legislative bodies on a virtual using virtual mediums, as well as the legislative bodies being able to meet using virtual mediums and, and mixing the two. And for us, the challenge was, how do we do this uniformly? How do we do that and take equity into consideration, the digital divide into, into consideration? Neighborhood councils were contacting us to say, how's this gonna work? Are some of our, we have, we, have, we have board members that don't even use email, just to give you a sense of all that we're trying to manage. So when we continued the suspension of meetings in April in order to put the EVG together, we took into consideration a lot that was going on with the neighborhood councils. It was never intended to be punitive. We just needed to regroup and figure out how we were gonna do this systematically in a way that worked for everybody. We made a commitment to roll it out May 1st and we stuck with that. We're now revising the EVG. All of us have had the shared experience of being able to work in a virtual environment now for, what is it now, um, seven months? No, almost 10 months since the pandemic, right? Painful, painful to think about. So it's a good time for us to think about what changes we need to make, what we need to look at in terms of our protocols. We've had meetings with you, uh, neighborhood councils collectively about the EVG protocols. You've given us feedback. Uh, we're hoping to have a meeting with the vice president of Zoom next month, at which point we plan to present to them um, 
you know, just uh, we're going to light candles and see what kind of mojo we can create to see if they might be interested in modifying some of the features that they have on Zoom so that they're applicable to governance. Zoom is not designed for governance. It's designed for conferences, workshops, and meetings. It's not designed for parliamentary procedures. It's not designed for the brown neck. So we hope we've got a list of feedback that we've had from you. There was a meeting that was hosted in, in December. Neighborhood councils, um, you know, Glenn Bailey co-hosted that with me. You gave us feedback. We're rolling that into a presentation that uh, I saw a draft of this week. And you know, hopefully, uh, the spirits will will. We're our our pitch to them is we're the second largest city in the United States. This is the largest grassroots dual democracy in the United States. It's worth it for you in terms of your company to be able to have features on your platform that engage the public at this at this at this very local level. Here's a list of things that we think you may want to consider in order to improve your platform and to make it more competitive and of greater interest. Uh, and, and more suitable for the kind of work that we do. Wouldn't that be great? That's kind of, I know, I'm just kind of working on my pitch here. So we are also going to be revising the EBG uh, along, along, along with that. We are undecided in terms of hybrid meetings. Here's, here's, you also need to stay with us, be in the conversation. We need for you to be in discussion with us uh, in, 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 in a positive way. We've got to figure this out. Once the pandemic is lifted and in-person meetings are, 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 are possible, um, we already know that, and I, and I, uh, I should have, I should have bet on this because I told the commission, I told my staff, I told the mayor and the city council offices, and I told neighborhood councils, you're going to like virtual meetings. I've been on, worked on Zoom before I came to the department. I knew what its pluses were. I knew that, I mean, a lot of us knew, but, uh, but doing it in a system was quite different with the Brown Act and parliamentary procedure elements to it. And then in a regulated arena. So the question for me as a general manager becomes, how do we do that? How do we have what I'm referring to as hybrid meetings? How do we give you the greatest flexibility to be able to use virtual platforms in a, in a way that's systematic so that as a, as a department, we can provide you direct neighborhood council support, but in some, in some in the least regulated uniform way is kind of the way I would like to articulate it. Um, and so we are going to need to in, you know, kind of do a lot of research related to that, including just figuring out what the authority is of the department to be able to make decisions. So for example, what if one council doesn't want to use Zoom and they want to use WebEx? What if this happens over here? What if you want to have your commit, you know, some committees meeting virtually and others meeting in person? How do we as a department provide support through all of that, how is the ENS system supposed to be able to sustain all of that? You're gonna need guidance from us. We're gonna to need to talk to the city attorney's office. How does all of that work? How do we give you the greatest flexibility to meet your personal needs, your collective needs, and as well as the needs of the stakeholders that you serve? How is all that gonna happen? And what, what makes sense? Not to mention there's no resources available to do anything much differently than what we're already doing. So. We are thinking ahead, we're, we're pulling these thoughts together. We're not waiting until the last minute. It's gonna take time to work all these things through. And, um, but we just are sharing with you that, that we, we want to be in conversation with you with all of that. And we hope you're paying attention to the notifications that we send out, maybe some surveys that we send out and please, and please respond so that we can have, have your input. So I'm gonna stop there and, and uh, and let you and let you oh the last piece is the outreach for the elections and this is the last item uh so as i mentioned everything was cut in our budget even down to the last thirty thousand dollars of money that we had in this budget for outreach the city clerk did a really good job creating a vote by mail system you know they had to shift gears everything was supposed to be in person pandemic hit Budgets had to be submitted for approval in this fiscal year. They had to make some choices. They decided to go and try, try to design a vote by mail system for the neighborhood council elections. They probably did that in about 90 days. So the question became, well, Dunn's responsible for outreach. How's that supposed to take place? So we had to wait for them to finish creating the system to figure out how the outreach would have to be created. Three deadlines are in the system. Candidate filing deadlines, the deadline by when people have to submit applications to request a ballot, and then the actual day of voting. The second deadline is the biggest obstacle, obstacle to overcome. 
telling people like me who are permanent absentee ballot voters that it doesn't matter, I've got to fill out an application in order to vote in my neighborhood council if I want to do that. That means promoting the neighborhood council system. The best way to do this in a virtual environment, in a pandemic, in a vote by mail environment is through partnerships. That's what our strategy is, is centered around. It was in April and in, in, uh, in November when we were finally able to get funding from the city council approved, which thanks to came to the city clerk's office. They had money that was left over from uh, the, the municipal elections that they weren't going to be using. We were able to go to city council after we presented the plan that they approved and did a lateral transfer from the city clerk's office over to our department. So it wasn't a negative impact on the general fund. Were that not to have been the case, we, would never ha we wouldn't have a penny to do outreach for this neighborhood council election. And we were, and we advocated strong. We still had to advocate strong. I had to fight to get this, you know, and uh, not that there was anybody that didn't want to do it, but it's just that the pandemic and the fiscal crisis were really big obstacles. Uh, and we we basically said, if you're not going to fund outreach at, at some decent level, then why you shouldn't have the, the election. You shouldn't burden neighborhood councils with the responsibility of doing 100% of the outreach for period, and then much less for something that's complicated. It's just not fair to them. So it's so the strategy has has partnerships. We're bringing on uh, partners to do uh, mainstream media, uh, promoting neighborhood councils as a whole. We think that's those are strong stories that we want to push out. We want people to hear your stories. Uh, try to get some interviews, maybe some radio interviews on KPCC. Also to try to get interviews in mainstream uh, mediums. Also community-based uh, communications, um, digital, digital uh, newsletters um, that, that are servicing communities at a local level. Maybe get an interview of somebody you gave an MPG to who can talk about what they did with the funding based on the support that their neighborhood council provided to them, just as an example. So broad citywide support, looking to, to be able to tell your stories and why neighborhood councils are important. Another level of citywide support is going to be through our sister departments. DWP and Park and Rec have agreed to communicate uh, about the neighborhood council elections through their medium. They're not, they're not asking for us to fund it at all. Really thankful for that partnership. DWP is even going to activate some of their social media, particularly next door. Neighborhood councils use Nextdoor quite a bit, so they're going to activate that as a resource. We're investing in social and, and, and digital uh, media ads. Similar to 2019, we reached a million people through those digital media ads. We want to do the same thing in this particular year. The difference is that we're not going to be investing in LinkedIn. It didn't materialize into the kind of results that we're hoping for. The next level of contracts is going to be with a company called uh, Eviteris, where these contracts are still, we're trying to get them approved. Eviteris specializes in, um, in working, uh, they've done a lot of work in Los Angeles and throughout the state of California. It's an African-American owned uh, consulting firm that is designed and has the infrastructure to do this kind of polling and survey work. The focus will be using two mediums, uh, around the three deadlines we talked about, one is text messaging and the other is going to be emails. The next level of support is going to be from Altamed. Altamed is the leading uh, provider of healthcare, community-based healthcare in the County of Los Angeles. They have a division that is a civic engagement division. Their specialty is in, uh, they're, set, they're set up to do text messaging, emails, as well as phone, phone banking and their target will be um, the immigrant community, which is their client base, but their employees are throughout the city and they're gonna engage their employees as well in the neighborhood councils that they, that they serve. The next level, it really works on the uh, mandates from the city council. Engage the unhoused, get young people involved in the election and, and uh, do what you can to bring in more marginalized populations into the election process. So we're looking to release about 30 contracts to community-based partners. We've met, I, we've met with your chairman on our one-on-one -on -one session to talk about your outreach strategy she's given us um, uh, in that meeting as we are with having with all neighborhood councils suggestions on community-based partners that we should, we should be working with to service your NCs. Um, the scope of work is being approved by the city attorney's office. We're turning those contracts around as quickly as we possibly can to support to support your work. So in a nutshell, that's what we're planning uh, in terms of the election strategy. That's the election strategy plan. And I can now pause and respond to questions. Thank you.
Patty, you're muted. Patty. Patty, you need to unmute yourself. The, there we uh, go. People keep texting me while we're in the meeting and I can't, I didn't want you to hear it. Um, we're gonna do this the right way today. So each person gets a question. You do not get to make a speech before the question. You just get to ask your question. So we are not going to be here until midnight and we are not going to turn this into a town hall meeting. And I'm going to start over here. I see that we have one person who is in the attendees who has a hand up. Jamie Penn, is your hand up to ask Raquel Beltran a question? If so, I'm going to allow you to talk right now. No, those hands went down. Okay, then I'll close public comment on this. And Claudia, it's up to you. You have to remember to unmute too, hon. Um, there you go. Okay, so uh, my question, first of all, uh, thank you for being here. Um, and my, I guess my little speech is that I think you've, you've done a great job and can definitely tell the difference um, since you, you've taken over. Thank you. Um, and also, I would like to see if you have a council file within the mayor's budget that's just for the Empower LA budget that you can share with us. Yes, I'll follow up and send you the link to our budget that's on okay. the CAL's website. I'll be happy to do that. And, and we may have done that already in the monthly profiles, but I'll double check. Okay, thank you so much. You're um, welcome. Also for neighborhood council elections, um, it would be interesting if we could partnership with Metro and uh, to see, I know that some of their advertisement is outsourced to a private contractor, but some of it is still available through Metro. Um, and in downtown, that's, that's a very accessible thing for mainly for us. Thank so, you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Patricia? There, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, I was very interested to hear that you're going to be meeting with the vice president of Zoom. Um, I think Zoom has worked out. I mean, we were really lucky to have it during the pandemic. Um, but one issue that we've had, or I see it as an issue, I should really just speak for myself. Um, and that is that it's hard to, the commenters, um, it just has, we've had meetings that have just been out of control. Um, the commenters are sometimes just really abusive, loose, use foul language. Um, I, I just don't feel like it's, it's um, productive and um, we don't seem to be able to use Zoom in a way to keep the meeting flowing and to avoid those problems. I mean, I, um, as I said, I'm, you know, speaking for myself, but um, that's, that's, uh, that's my question is, it, you know, will you be talking to the, to the uh, vice president of Zoom about that? Uh, we won't be able to talk with him about uh, resolving problems with the, with the kinds of public comment that you receive per se, because of the laws that govern what people are able to say or what you're able to do in terms of public comment. It's certainly um, now, you know, some, some neighborhood councils aren't using the meeting feature. And if you have the meeting feature, then you're able to, you have greater latitude about who you bring into the meeting and who you don't, and it has its disadvantages. But on the broader question that you're asking, we are working with the city attorney's office to provide you additional guidance on what you can do to handle disruptive comments that come to you. Um, you will begin to see the city council also pushing more on that issue. So we're all actually pushing the city attorney to provide us better guidance. What I'm already working on is um, we've given you some guidance on how to handle disruptive public comment. I call it the, you know, the one potato, three potato, three, you know, one potato, two potato, three potato warnings, and then cut off their mic. So, so we, we have given you that, but we're working on uh, an, 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 a, a, a version of it that allows you to have some good scripted language to use when a person is testifying under public comment and they're not testifying about anything that is on your agenda. And they are additionally not testifying about something that's within the subject jurisdiction of the neighborhood council. 
um, that that will give you guidance so that you can actually mute their mic right away instead of giving them the three warnings. So it's a little bit the different scenarios, but that will be getting you closer at least to minimizing some of that. It's a little bit of practice for the chair to, to, to learn that script, to do it right so that so that it doesn't you know get called attention. But and we've been we've been doing that at the at the commission meeting. We had somebody who just got to the mic and the only thing they were talking about was um, about their political pers you know, their 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 party partisanship views about the um, about the attacks on the Capitol, completely outside of the subject jurisdiction of the Board of Neighborhood Commissioners, not on the agenda. So we were able to just mute their bike, Mike. It was just, and they were pretty foul about about their about their thoughts. So we're going to try to make sure we update that guidance for you to try to help you a little bit more on that. Thank you. You're welcome, Mac. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, Raquel, I, will, I also want to thank you for the incredible information you provided us. Um, I, I serve as a, a board direct business director for South Park. I'm also the chairperson for the Government Liaison Commission. I also work for DWP. And I'd like to talk to you about uh, California Public Records request. Um, as, as an employee of uh, DWP, we're very, very careful about uh, determining and following the laws for California Public Re Re uh, Records uh, Act requests, the time to react, exemptions, um, retention, um, all of these laws and whatnot. Um, when when we get a California Public Re uh, Records uh, request here, neighborhood council uh, for neighborhoods, um, it goes to the presidents. And there's what I don't know exact number now, 94 to 100 neighborhood councils. The neighborhood council presidents, I, I don't believe, get the training, um, get the information about uh, records retention, um, the, the law, how they log it. Uh, it seems like we we have a liability here um, that we're not recognizing. Um, it seems like there should, should be probably a single point of contact, maybe at your office, that they should all reside in and be recorded mm -hmm. or, or or stored. Um, to make sure that these things are not lost or misplaced or are actually being acted upon appropriately. What do you think about that? I would love to be able to do that. Um, my original proposed budget for the next, for this fiscal year was going to, was requesting money from the city council in order to be able to create a, uh, a, a dispute resolution unit in the, in the department. To, and CPR help, helping helping to process CPRI requests would have been one of the assignments in that in that unit. Um, obviously, it didn't happen for obvious reasons. I wanted to centralize grievances, CPRA requests, just fundamental board dynamic issues, labor relations investigations, exhaustive efforts, and censor and removal proceedings all in one unit in the admin division, reporting to the director of administration, who then reports to me. That means that the NEA that would have to, would get that lifted off of their shoulders. They could continue to do the monthly work for you and not have be sidetracked by that. 15% of the neighborhood councils drain 60% of the resources in this department, 15% because of bad board dynamics issue. Now that means 15 essentially neighborhood councils are draining 60% of the resources in the department just due to conflicts. So I was hoping that we could get a unit to do that. Now, that with not that said, we support neighborhood councils when they have CPRA requests. We don't do it for them. We get our own. And as you know, we, we could get one on us. We got to respond, all that kind of stuff. But we do ask neighborhood councils to reach out to the NEA and to the city attorney's office. We, will, we work and help neighborhood councils to comply with those CPRA requests. And sometimes they're just they're just overwhelming. I really feel for neighborhood councils when it comes to that. Um, I mean, sometimes it's just, uh, uh, there's one where there's 300 pages that have to be PDF'd and responded to. Um, and, um, if, and you know, if you've been reading about the controversy with the um, Crenshaw Mall, 
the neighborhood council that services that area, you can imagine the CPRI requests they've been getting. And that was the first time they ever had that. <laughs> and um, and it's been overwhelming. That was the first time they said, don't you guys do this for us? <laughs> we don't, but we, I think we should, um, but we're just not set up for that. The law says you have to reply, all that kind of stuff, but we, we, we always are open to helping. Um, sometimes you have to help, you need help just to assess what has to be uh, redacted personal right. contact that's what you're talking about the personal contact you, you need to contact us and we work with the city attorney's office to help you know what should be redacted that's confidential information that should be not shared that's legal legally can does not need to be shared with the requester and in many cases the, the requester knows more about the process than the neighborhood council does. Yes. And, and, and this could this could really ensue a, a liability issue. Well, we know of a couple of people that do it as a racket. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. and then they collect the fines. Right, yes. And they'll target you. Right, exactly. Sorry, it's unfortunate. It's just because it's just, you're volunteers. That's kind of mean. But, uh, and, but we, we, we give you support as, as best we can. We'll probably still try to pursue that and, you know, maybe through the, the city council. Thank you, ma'am. You're welcome, sir. Thanks, Mac. Rick? Raquel, thank you for being here tonight. I'm a uh, new board member. Uh, so this is like an orientation moment here. So excuse me if I'm asking some things that you may cover in your budget email. But I always am interested as a former nonprofit exec of what the trend line is for a department's budget. And I know there was a hit with uh, the whole city on the pandemic, but you have off the top of your head what your gross budget was or the FTEs were in the last three or four years? Because I'm, I'm curious about where the city and the council's support is for our neighborhood councils. So this year, our budget, our proposed budget is at 3 million. Mm -hmm. Um, it was uh, uh, it, at, at its highest point. It was over the past five years. I believe the highest point. It might have been a little under five million, just to give you a range. Um, but I'm happy to share that information with you. It's not it's not confidential. Um, and uh, and I'm really happy to hear you say that because it shocked me. Uh, and I've shared this that when we submitted our proposed budget, not one neighborhood council filed a CIS on our proposed budget and I, I was a little i asked them about that because i thought did we not maybe we didn't i was just concerned that i wasn't responsive in what i put in the budget to things that neighborhood councils had had requested and i was just kind of kind of polling i just kind of informally poll neighborhood council i just don't think they just, just they just didn't get to it i don't think it was a rejection of the budget i just i don't think it was just on the radar so um, I'm happy to hear feedback and get feedback from neighborhood councils about the proposed budget. In terms of FTEs, it's the uh, 20, it's thir uh, there's the 35 are still budgeted in the department full-time equivalents. Um, and, um, and there were, I think um, we, we cut them. There, there were some part-time people in there because of the elections, but all that got wiped out. So I, I think it, we just landed with just the 35. FTEs, two of which are the resolution positions that I mentioned to you. So we have to would have to ask for them every year uh, in order to get them. Great. Well, <clears throat> thank you for, for those details. I'll look forward to reading more. And congratulations on getting some money moved over for the elections. Uh, that was that, a big deal. We should all yeah. celebrate those victories. So yes, yes, they work. are. They're victories for all of us. Thanks. Thank you, Rick. Um, I guess I, I will take my turn and then we'll let you be. You've been here for so long and I know you have a few things to do, but um, I want to thank you for being here. I know it took a while for us to get together, but uh, it has been a very strange 10 months and I think we can be forgiven a lot of things because of it. Uh, Raquel, it, it's really been a pleasure watching the changes and some of the things that you're doing with the departments. Please, please, please remember that the whole reason that neighborhood councils were invented was because every neighborhood is very different and needs different things, different guidance and needs its own, own group to say, this is what we need here. Forget the rest of the world, this is what we need here. I think there's been a, 
a movement of late to try and codify us in a way that we cannot be codified. Everybody should do this. Everybody should do that. We're going to have this happening. We're going to have this. Please, please keep in mind that there, there are differences and that I believe that our neighborhood council is probably the most different from all of the others of any of the ones that are in the, in this, in this city. We don't have one house in our neighborhood council, not one single unit family dwelling here where we are a completely different animal than any other neighborhood council could possibly be. Please keep that in mind while you're looking at, at yes, make things easier for us, but please remember that we're different. And one of the things that I would throw up there is the, is the issue of uh, making everyone who serves on a planning committee take that training. I took it. I did not learn a thing. I've been doing this for too many years. Our particular planning committee has people on it who were planning, uh, were ran planning for uh, different different councilmen during the during the uh, last ten years. People who are who work within the system who've been on the in the planning department of this city. And I really think that it's an insult to say that anyone needs to take this training, especially since it is ridiculously simplistic. I'm just going to leave it at that. But again, thank you so much for the work you're doing. Thank you for giving us so much of your time today. I hope we'll be able to have you come by again. Uh, I'm sorry we couldn't do a more interesting meeting for you. This is no, this probably is, this is fine. This is I just want to talk to people <laughs> and listen and hear you. And uh, I'm really Great. happy you. I can see you having somebody who has that nonprofit background. I'm really really happy to hear that. We are planning an onboarding process after the elections for all the new board members mirroring the best practices in the nonprofit world for, for boards. Uh, I really am committed to between the months of March and June to have an onboarding series for the newly elected board members so that effective July 1st, all board members will at least start with the same understanding, same at least baseline understanding from the department. You all can do your own onboarding with your with your newly elected folks or re-elected folks but you know there's a problem with people just not having the right when you talk about the codification piece it's just making sure everybody has the same understanding of what the ground rules are what the roles are boards and all that kind of stuff it is the reason why i'm leaning toward um having all boards terms starting effective july 1st i'm kind of i'm gravitating to that because we we need to help people come on board and we need to spend that time and um, nonprofit boards do that. You you can still, if you have an early election in March, you can still include people in your budget development process. It's a part of a transition. It's part of best practices in nonprofit world. That can happen in the neighborhood council system as well, so that people, you know, you can include them in those decisions and and hear them out as stakeholders um, in in that process. Well, so that would be wonderful if you're going to do that. Please. Take a look at things that neighborhood councils are not supposed to do. We get too many people that get elected. They have an issue in mind. It's really important to them. They want to get on the neighborhood council to promote that issue. It's something completely outside of the purview of a neighborhood council. Mm -hmm. And we lose that person. Yes. I think it's really important that, that people understand what neighborhood councils do, but more importantly, what we don't do. Right. I, I, that's extremely important. I, I, I like that emphasis and, uh, and support that. I'm sorry we can't help you on the planning one-on-one -on -one trainings. That will require a change in policy or, or, uh, or council action because it actually happened in, in two ways. Um, and, uh, and I do, I do, you are unique in terms of the, the issues that you address. I can, I'm not surprised that you have people on your planning committee that are well-versed in this area, perhaps attorneys and such that are, are well-versed. They're going to have to take the training so we won't be able to waive it. Um, I just thought of a, something that you could maybe consider. I just thought of it now, actually, um, Maybe we could think in terms of, uh, I know this is going to, nothing I'm going to say is not going to be insulting to them because I know they're, they're in, a, in a very elite group of people who understand planning and land use, but maybe there's just a way to take the test at the end. And if they pass the test at the end, then they don't have to take the whole training. Um, but that's an idea I just thought of. Don't, don't hate it. But, uh, but anyway, I was just trying to brainstorm a little bit. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Raquel. Much appreciated. You're welcome.
I appreciate you and I look forward to talking to you soon. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm Thank sure you. talking. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, let's see where, where did I leave off? I would not ask for committee reports because no committees met. Is there any committee that still needs to make a report? Okay. Are there any officers who need to make a report? December was a dead month. Yeah, Patty. All right, then we're, yes, who's, who's calling who didn't raise their hand? Up, Marcus, just general housekeeping <laughs> for outreach. Hello, Madam President, thank you. I'll be quick because I know everyone wants to get home. We have our outreach, our January first outreach meeting of 2021 scheduled for this coming Monday, the 18th, um, 2021 at seven o'clock PM. We're gonna be discussing our election uh, forum planning and our outreach strategy around uh, the election. It's gonna be very interesting stuff, so please be there. Uh, outreach agenda items are due this Thursday in two days by 5 p.m. to marcus.lovinggood at dlink.com. Thank you everybody and happy new year. Marcus, yes. um, the 18th is MLK Day, FYI. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I, obviously I didn't even have to hear that. That's fine. Um, nothing else, very good. Then I'm going to go to the second general public comment. I see a couple of hands up. So um, let's see, Peter. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, you know, I, I wanted to speak um, sort of similarly to what I spoke about earlier, um, but sort of from a different tack um, and just specifically urging you to act quickly um, on the proposals that I put forward earlier. I know the board's um, term is ending in March. Um, and, you know, to this point, DLANC has taken zero action about any of the uh, Jose Huizar corruption. Um, I know that some of you probably, especially on the planning land use committee, are probably sick of hearing from me about it. Uh, but I think it's really important, um, you know, specifically for this neighbor council to consider how you use the power that you have. Um, and especially the fact that developers come here asking for letters of support. Um, and you have a unique point of leverage within the city of Los Angeles to ask for things uh, when they do that. Um, you know, earlier this year, you had the developers for the 100 South Grand project come to you asking for sign district changes. Um, we know that those developers made donations to Huizar's high school, um, employed Maury Goldman, um, who's been shown to be massively corrupt, was involved in the Carmel uh, partners project you know there are all these issues where these companies publicly will refuse to provide public information they refuse to comment they refuse to comment to the la times but they have to come to d-link to ask you for something and i think it's really important that you know what you do with carmel partners you know get the 14 million get the 52 units but more broadly you really should consider what the role of the planning and land use committee is and aggressively using the fact that people are coming to you asking for something to get information that they have otherwise denied to the general public. Um, and it's, I just think, you know, you, you have a chance, I think, with the Common Partners Project to start that, do that for the first time. Um, and then I think, you know, hopefully um, when a new board comes in in March, you know, to sort of show them a way to continue doing that work. Um, because I think, I think it's really important, especially here in downtown, um, that uh, this neighborhood council leads the way on that. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm doing this on my own because my VP Hi. is sick. So let me see who's next. Damon. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. Um, wow. Just brought all that up. Um, that's actually the reason I'm here too. Um, it's a little disappointing. I was unaware that you guys hadn't taken any action on, um, any of the Weezar corruption stuff. Um, our city council is a cesspool <laughs> of corruption. Um, and you guys are right at the heart of it. 
Um, and the city council itself has zero interest in policing itself or taking any action. So we're really hoping that you guys can actually turn up the heat a little bit on this. Um, it's absurd that Carmel Partners got away with this 14 million that they bribed Weezar and they're only paying a $1.2 million fine. That, that, I mean, that is the definition of crime pays right there. Um, so I think if Peter seems to be bugging you guys about this and reaching out to you, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding why you're not being receptive to that. This is exactly the kind of thing that you're supposed to do as elected representatives is to use the power that you have as leverage um, and to speak for the people. And there's a lot of people that are angry about how what's going down here. So I, I would hope that, as Peter said, you would work with some urgency on this. Um, use the power that you've been given. Um, so yeah, please reach out to him if you need help because he obviously has this whole uh, situation clocked. Thank you. Um, Peter, if you're still there, please no him. No, no. I, I was just gonna say, if you draft no. the letter, um, no. I, I'll, I'll have it at no. our next government liaison meeting. After the comment is over, if you want to comment on something that was said, we can. Not while we're doing it, please. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I was just trying to help. I know, but I've got I've got to have the same rules for everybody. Okay, I'll, I'll reach out to Peter. Uh, okay. Uh, Patty spells her name the same way I do. Yeah, hi, Patty. Um, sorry you didn't hi, uh, uh, call on me when you were taking calls for uh, Raquel, but uh, I, I want to point out that Pete, what everything Peter said is what I was going to say. He uh, is just probably far more articulate than me. And uh, I just really feel it's important to hammer the point that you know there's more than one person out here feeling this way as a stakeholder. Um, you know, if anything of the past year has shown us is that people are tired of sitting around and watching uh, these bad things and these corrupt uh, acts happening, and we're just tired of it and we can't stand for it anymore. You know, and the biggest part about this was the loss of affordable housing, something that we really, really need in this city and in in downtown, especially. Uh, it things are only going to get worse with the economic downturn of this pandemic. Um, it's just important that we just can't stand by and watch this happen anymore. And I really feel it's important that we take a stand and you know say something and you do as future. And uh, Harold Mack, uh, I appreciate you, even though you were out of turn, but uh, please put something together, please vote on something. Um, and I also find it incredibly rude that most of you are looking down when a lot of people are talking. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Stacy. Stacy. Hello. Okay. Hi. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having us here for public comment. Um, I'm also calling about the Carmel Partners, and I wanted, and I feel like um, other other speakers have have given the lowdown in a way that that I I could not um, as eloquently say. But let's just put it this way: they they made a they made a profit off of off of. Um, corruption and this case this is still unfolding we have another sitting council sitting council member john lee who um can't escape his staff or b status he's named and we've got another we had uh, D cd 14 was empty that seat was empty because of this for a long time and now we've got someone sitting in 12 who shouldn't be there and so this is a bigger picture than just the carmel partners thing but i say absolutely demand 14 million to go back into to this area D definitely demand it 52 units of affordable housing must be returned to the area you have a lot of power and you can use it. I want to point out that it's not isolated to Carmel. It's not isolated to this situation. 
situation. You've got to keep your eyes open for any project that's passed through that Maury Goldman has had part of. He got a plea deal. He would be sitting behind bars if he didn't. But there's another player that's a part of the um, urban strategy lobbyist group, and that's Arturo Gonzalez. And he's all over it, too. Downtown is the place where it's happening. They think they're going to do it to us. But we're Angelinos. We, and we actually know what's going on now. So the, the, the gig is up for City Hall. I'd love to see you grasp your power and take advantage of this moment. I'd love to see us all hold our city council members accountable and say, you know, we're not gonna sell it for a song. This is our city, this is where we live. And it doesn't mean that we're anti-development because development can be done responsibly. And if you're tired of seeing unhoused people, well, that's because there's no affordable housing. So we can embrace our neighbors in that way. We can get over some of these problems by saying, let's do it right. We don't need to have like billionaire, a billionaire LLCs that have total opacity. We don't have any access to the identities of the people who are buying our land out from underneath us. It's not even ours, but that's a whole other story. The stolen land that they buy and sell. Um, so I just ask you, take take advantage of the, the knowledge and the research that um, people, we're collaborating with you. We know it's a hard job and you're volunteers and we appreciate it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Stacy. Alex? Alex? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. I, yeah, so I just want to reiterate what everybody else is talking about. And I just, I keep thinking about, you know, it's like a million and something dollar fine on $14 million in savings, right? And I keep thinking about what could our neighborhood do with $13 million in investment? if that money were to actually come back to the people that it was taken from in some way. And that's the thing that I can't get out of my head. Cause wouldn't y'all love to have $13 million to put into parks or street lights or fixing potholes or whatever it is. Like, isn't there something that y'all would want that I would want that could be done. And it just, it sits with me so wrong whenever I hear about, these fines that don't add up anywhere nearly as close as it comes to the total that's that's essentially stolen. And I think about, you know, if I, I don't know, if I go into like Best Buy and I steal a thousand dollar TV, right? And then I get caught that I take a plea deal and then I get to keep the TV, but I only have to pay a hundred dollars. Why wouldn't everyone just do that? We're incentivizing it when we don't take it seriously. And we know from the records that just got released that we've got another person sitting on the plum committee who's implicated in all this mess. And so I think it's up, it's up to us as a neighborhood to say enough is enough. And so that, that's it. Thanks for having me and letting me speak. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Patty. Thank you, Alex. I'm sorry, this takes so long in between, guys, but I'm trying. Pat. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. So I'm calling in like the rest of my neighbors. Um, just the fact that Carmel just has gotten to profit off of their crime um, is how I'm choosing to look at it. I mean, they did. They saved the fourteen million. Then they paid the one million. That's still net thirteen million. Um, it's just, I, and I love what the previous caller said. I mean, like, if crime's profitable, why doesn't everybody do it? So I just, you are our council. I just, I implore you to just please, just be the buffer. These these developers are are just trying to run over the top of us. And you are very literally the last defense that the community has. Um, we just ask that you use what tools you have at your disposal to please stop the bleeding because there's, there's more than just this going on. I mean, this is what we know about. So, I mean, please just whatever you can do to keep these uh, very low income units in the community what you can do to stop these developers from just completely taking advantage of our community, 
we would really, really appreciate it. Thank you. I yield the rest Thank of my time. You. Thank you. Uh, I have two more here, and then I am going to cut off public comment. Kevin? Hi. Um, thanks for uh, taking our comments. I just want to, um, again, not to hammer it too hard, but uh, Peter really knocked it out of the park. Um, one thing I want to mention is that, uh, you know, in the past, City Hall has been shrouded in this cloud of secrecy where they hide behind these off-year elections and low voter turnout and low participation by, by the public in local politics. And I, I, I'm, as I'm sure you all know, that time in LA politics is over. Um, it, it ended this past election cycle with uh, the election of people like Mithya Raman and George Gascon and a, a groundswell of involvement in local politics. And I say all this because, you know, it, it should also light a fire under neighborhood councils, you know, because this means that you have the uh, leeway and the, and the opportunity to really make a difference, really make, you know, flex the power that you wield in order to bring, uh, you know, shine light on, on people like Carmel Partners and, uh, crooked people like Jose Huizar and uh, Stafford B. John Lee and CD12. Um, so just, just to reiterate, it's, it's moving forward, it's definitely um, acceptable and within the bounds of uh, LA politics to really go after these people and not let them hide behind the sort of secrecy that's been profiting uh, developers and politicians in the city for too long. I hope the rest of my time. Thank you, Kevin. And the last one is JV. JV? Hi. Oh, yes, hi. Can you? Hi, I'd just like to point out that I understand, I've been listening to the public comments and I understand the frustration with the case. You know, I agree that the fine was inappropriate for the amount that was saved. I think the lobbyist, you know, should be in prison. However, I'd like to point out and just remind people there are things that neighborhood councils can and cannot do. Government liaison committees put out community impact statements to council files, uh, actions that are pending in front of the city council. And I'd just like to remind everyone that the non-prosecution agreement was a federal non-prosecution agreement. This was done by the FBI. Um, the outrage is appropriate, but I think it might be a little bit misdirected. Uh, neighborhood councils can only send community impact statements to the city council and things that are pending with council motions. I think a more appropriate venue might be turning to your congressmen and to people that have purview over the Department of Justice, because that's where this is being decided, uh, this egregious non-prosecution agreement not at the city level. So when we're asking why the government liaison committee hasn't taken a stand on it, I think we have to keep things like that in mind, what the neighborhood council is and is not, and what they're permitted under the city charter to do. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, I am now officially closing public comment. Doing all this by myself, and I think I'm doing pretty good, even without the help. Um, and we're going to go right now to board member comment. Mac, I know you want to speak, so please do. Yes, I, and I'd like to thank everyone for their comments and um, the last uh, person as well. Mac, be careful not to make this a conversation. No, just that, a that's all I'm saying. Okay. Um, um, I'm, I'm the chair of the Government Liaison Committee. I invite anyone to submit um, to our Government Liaison Committee. If you want something on the agenda um, and it's not on the board uh, of, of the city council, it's not already a uh, on the agenda of the city council, we can submit a letter. Uh, but what I ask for folks to do is to draft a letter, not just give me a topic. So um, 
I'm just kind of giving people instruction of how I can do things. We could, we could get a topic if something is about local things, or we could give a topic and ask the city council to do a resolution or something as kind of a, a gesture. But that's probably our limits in, in, in um, cases that are, are more global. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ryan, you wanted to make a board comment? I did. Um, it's in relation, in some, not, not as a conversation, but in response, obviously, to uh, the overwhelming sentiment that we heard from the attendees. Um, I, I think they're definitely correct, and we have heard this in the past. I think the time since this was originally brought up has been spent, you know, admittedly, this is a part-time job for a lot of us. We're not spending, you know, 24 hours a day working on this stuff. Um, but we definitely have tried to make strides to figure out how, number one, what is the neighborhood council able to do uh, and figuring out sort of the legality and the purview of our neighborhood council as it relates to this issue. But more importantly, moving forward, how to create language, how to create consideration for future projects to be a little bit more in, in a more preventative sense. Um, you know, I, I think uh, if I can call it Peter, he was there last month and definitely spoke about this last month. Um, admittedly, you know, we, we don't have anything on the agenda this month uh, regarding the matter, but we're definitely making strides to it. And, um, you know, to the extent that planning and land use, which frankly is a very, you know, we have very, very long, you know, sometimes five, six hour meetings. Um, and, and the majority of our time is spent looking at and reviewing projects as they're presented. Um, but we're definitely making an attempt to add this, you know, to our, to our purview to the extent that's legally possible. So don't think that, you know, we're sidestepping this, um, uh, you know, I, we're, we're getting to the point where we're really having a discussion about this issue. I mean, which I'm, was I'm talking, I'm talking to myself. There's, there's really no, no second. I, I know, question. but it's, you spoke and Max spoke and Claudia, you're not speaking on this topic. So if you've got something else, please join us. I understand. Listen, but it was, you have, I, I really think we're getting close to the edge. I'm having a discussion. I think it's not appropriate. Nice topic. Okay. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say something in the general sense. It has nothing to do with any of the things that have just been discussed. It has to, it has any to of do with, with planning in general. No, we're, we're too far into that right now. Please be careful. Um, I think that an operator is an operator and uh, we always consider- All right, this no, this is, you are you are discussing something that is not a gesture. I feel like I'm this sorry, is becoming it's gone, it's gone an election campaign. We need to discuss this. And maybe it's not John, appropriate. John, we do need okay. to discuss it's obvious, okay. but we did not agendize it, and we cannot do it right. here. We cannot. So it's in our heads. We know what's going on. The discussion is going to have to happen at another time. If there is a requirement for a special meeting to discuss something like this, I need to have it delivered to me. But we cannot discuss it now. So I am, I'm going to cut this off before we end up getting ourselves into trouble and into a topic that we didn't agendize. Um, our next meeting is Tuesday, February 9th, just a few days before Valentine's Day. So maybe we can all dress in pink or something like that for the occasion. Uh, hopefully we'll have a few more items because some of our committees will start meeting again. I want to really thank everybody who came out today, who spoke to us. I would like to, uh, I wanna thank you guys for sitting. We had a very, very long presentation, longer than usual, but I think it was worthwhile for us to hear what they have to say from Dunn. And I really, uh, I, I appreciate you all being here. And if we are to continue with this topic, please let's do it at a time when it has been properly agendized. Thank you. If there is nothing else, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Barrett, I make a motion to adjourn. Thank you, thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Thank a you, third. Okay, guys. If you wish to discuss anything later, let me know. Bye.